Last night, I dreamt I went to Manderley again. It seemed to me I stood by the iron gate leading to the drive. And for a while, I could not enter. That's the haunting monologue that begins Alfred Hitchcock's 1940 film, Rebecca. Starring Laurence Olivier, Joan Fontaine, and Judith Anderson, and based on the hugely popular novel by Daphne du Maurier, Rebecca tells the story of an unnamed narrator, a young and inexperienced woman. In this video, I'll be referring to her as Mrs. De Winter or the second Mrs. De Winter, just to avoid some later confusion, who, while working as a paid companion in the south of France, meets wealthy widower George, George Fortescue, Fortescue Maximilian. Maximilian. You needn't bother with them all at once. My family call me Max. And I would too, because that's a mouthful. After a whirlwind of a courtship, they marry, and she is whisked off to Maxim's family estate in Cornwall. The home is called Manderley, a sprawling ancestral pile that seems to be haunted in every nook and cranny by the memories of Maxim's dead first wife, Rebecca. And with this gothic tale of a haunted house and memories of the past and a marriage with secrets, Alfred Hitchcock made his American film debut. I think people are intrigued by mystery to find out about things they don't know anything about. Alfred Hitchcock was the biggest director in England. His films like The 39 Steps, The Lady Vanishes, and Sabotage had cemented his place as the number one master technician of thrills and suspense. But movie making in England was not the same as movie making in Hollywood. In England, there was very little prestige in being a film director, and there was very little of the adjacent glamour that the Hollywood crowd indulged in. Also, advances in filming techniques and cameras and lighting and special effects were all happening in California. Hitchcock began to see his future in the United States, and he signed a seven-year contract with independent producer and studio head David O. Selznick, who, in 1939, was frantically working to complete Gone with the Wind. Selznick's first collaboration with Hitchcock was to be the epic story of the sinking of the Titanic. But outfitting and sinking the retired ocean liner, the SS Leviathan, which was Selznick's plan, proved to be too cost prohibitive. So Selznick turned to a literary property that he had the rights to, Du Maurier's Rebecca. He tasked Hitchcock with coming up with the script. And Hitchcock's initial script played up the action and downplayed the gothic romance. Selznick called it cheap and vulgar. He told Hitchcock he had every intention of making the book, not some botched up version. He believed film adaptations of novels should be more or less faithful, and his previous films based on literary works more or less followed that guiding principle. And Selznick had a flair for the romantic, and he knew that young women identified with the second Mrs. De Winter, and his experience with Gone with the Wind and the frenzy surrounding the adaptation of that book informed the way that he crafted his women-centered stories. To Hitchcock, even an international bestseller was nothing more than a springboard for his own ideas. This is really a new departure for me, he said in the November 5th, 1938 edition of Film Weekly. I shall treat this more or less as a horror film, building up my violent situations from incidents such as one in which the young wife innocently appears at the annual fancy dress ball given by her husband in a frock identical with the one worn by his wife a year previously. Side note, De Marie had hated Hitchcock's version of her book Jamaica N precisely because of the liberties he'd taken with the source material. Selznick reiterated, we bought Rebecca and we intend to make Rebecca. And while Selznick was controlling and a micromanager and also operating on little to no sleep because he was pumped full of benzodrines in order to keep up with the work of preparing Rebecca, finishing Gone with the Wind, Ingrid Bergman's debut in Intermezzo, and firing off an insane amount of memos, he did have a track record of producing hits. He'd been the one to bring Katharine Hepburn and Fred Astaire to Hollywood. At RKO, he'd produced King Kong. And while at MGM, he was behind such smash hits as Dinner at Eight. Do you know that the guy says that machinery is going to take the place of every profession? Oh, my dear. That's something you need never worry about. And Manhattan Melodrama. Gonna give me everything I got coming to me. At his own studio, besides producing the film adaptation of Gone with the Wind, 
the original version of A Star is Born, The Prisoner of Zenda, and Nothing Sacred. All had been smash hits. So while Hitchcock was the master of suspense, Selznick also knew how to craft an opulent and glamorous hit movie. And he directed Hitchcock back to the root of the story. And at the center of the story was a romance and a house, a large Gothic mansion situated somewhere in England on the Cornish coast, Manderley, that seems to be haunted in every nook and cranny by the memories of Rebecca. Manderley is based on a real home, well, two homes. Author Daphne du Maurier, while living in Cornwall, stumbled upon an abandoned house in the dense forest. That house, built in the 1580s and totally forgotten by the 1930s and in ruins, was Minabilly. And the seeds for du Maurier's Manderley lay in the ruins of Minabilly. It was what she envisioned as she worked on her novel. As for the luxurious interiors of Mandalay, de Maurier recalled visits she'd made to Milton Hall during the First World War. In correspondence later in her life, she stated that when she wrote Rebecca, the interior of Mandalay was based on her recollections of the rooms and big house feel of Milton during World War I. Hitchcock also had a vision of Mandalay, and he and Selznick and their team scouted homes in England and the United States and Canada. This had to be a special house that would be shown in all its romantic glory, in sunlight and in moonlight, in storms, menacing and welcoming, and then a burned, smoldering shell. In the end, there was no suitable house, so Mandalay was created by Selznick's master visual effects team, headed by Jack Cosgrove, with a combination of studio sets, miniatures, and matte painting. Two models of the house were built. One was 50 feet wide and took up an entire sound stage. It was left to production designer Lyle Wheeler to create the gothic romantic settings, and he designed 20 interiors for Mandalay, including a cavernous main hall, ornate rooms, gigantic fireplaces, towering staircases, high doors, and massive chandeliers. Selznick initially resisted the use of miniatures, feeling that they would look fake, but Hitchcock had staged miniature scenes with success before in films like The Lady Vanishes, and he was confident that he could achieve exactly the look they wanted through their use, and he was right. Hitchcock commented, The picture is the story of a house. The house is one of the three characters. Our first glimpse of Mandalay does appear like a dream, before dark clouds blot out all the sunny warmth of the couple's time in Monte Carlo. And then we meet Mrs. Danvers. How do you do? I have everything in readiness for you. She's the head housekeeper. She's the tour guide to the past. She's always there lurking as if she's an element of the house, as much a part of it as the wood in the glass. And her presence keeps Rebecca's memory fixed in the house. She's the curator of Rebecca's Manderley. The entire second act of the film takes place in the house or on its grounds, and we realize that Maxim frequently comes and goes from the house, but Mrs. De Winter never does. The house is isolated in a neither here nor there location. Hitchcock later said, To some extent, this was due to the fact that the picture was made in the United States. Let us assume that we'd made Rebecca in England. The house would not have been so isolated because we'd have been tempted to show the countryside and the lanes leading to the house. We would have lost a sense of isolation. And Mrs. De Winter's psychological state is affected by the house and that isolation. Its memories and Mrs. Danvers' manipulation play on her mind and her self-confidence and her psyche. Mrs. De Winter was most particular about sources. Um, let's have whatever you think that Mrs. De Winter would have ordered. And to me, Mrs. Danvers' black uniform always seemed like a black hole, ready to engulf and devour the young Mrs. De Winter. Hitchcock photographs Joan Fontaine draped in shadows. The rooms dwarf her, and she's overwhelmed by the home's enormity and its luxury and history. She literally and figuratively gets lost in the house. Oh, uh, no. Uh, which way is the morning room? Oh, it's that door there, on the left. Oh, yes, thank you. I remember in the film, Rebecca, the young girl there, was brought to a big house. She was very scared. So naturally, when she walked into this big room, you made her small. In fact, 
To make her feel afraid, I even had a fan blow her hair slightly, even though the windows weren't open. Mandalay is the De Winter ancestral home, but during the film, we never see spaces that are specifically assigned to Maxim. The bedrooms and the morning room belong to the Mrs. De Winters. And at the center of all of this is the ornate carved double doors that lead to Rebecca's bedroom. A bedroom that represents femininity, sex, and romance. Everything that the new Mrs. De Winter does not feel that she possesses. In this room, we really get to know Rebecca through Mrs. Danvers. Rebecca's presence and influence have been felt since the beginning, even in Monte Carlo, but the bedroom is her shrine. It holds her lingerie, her silks, her furs, hairbrush, and her bed. And it's in Rebecca's bedroom that we realize Mandalay is a psychological prison for both Mrs. De Winter and Mrs. Danvers. Mrs. Danvers, she's gone mad. She said she'd rather destroy Mandalay than see us happy here. There are eight million stories in the cinema cities. This has been one.